Hello, I'm Will Yeoman, CEO of Writing WA, and welcome to another edition of Pod Street, Writing WA's special podcast where we focus on local authors and other amazing stories. And there are lots out there. And today it's extra special because I'm actually at RTR FM Studios here in uh, Mount Lawley. And I'm talking to Simon Morado, who apart from being the manager here, is that right, Simon, is the author of the new book, Book of the Band. Simon, welcome to Pod Street. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So look, a very contentious issue more broadly, if we think about freedom of speech, for example, we think about censorship and all these other art forms, you're specifically focusing on film, but not just film, Australian cinema, and you give a lovely overview of the history of censorship in Australia in regards to film as well. But look, to start with, can you give us a broad overview of the book and also what prompted you to write it? Yeah, so I was a film critic for about 15 years Mm. uh, before taking over as general manager at RTR, and I still have a film segment on RTR on Friday mornings uh, called Movie School that I co-host with Tristan mm-hmm. Fiddler. But I, I, I started very early. I was, I was a very young professional film critic, and professional can be put in inverted <laughs> commas there. Uh, I was 20, and then I discovered that, this was 2008, that The Hangover and Bruno, um, these raunchy, ribald, R-rated in America comedies, were coming to Australia. They were rated MA, but they had been recut by the distributor. They'd cut out a couple of jokes, a couple of you know, contentious moments to get a more lenient classification mm. here. Mm. And I thought, as a 20-year-old dude, how dare they? How dare they cut down the hangover? <laughs> you know, <laughs> these totally, you know, pointless films ultimately. And then I, I that was sort of, I guess, the entry point, right? And then I discovered that it wasn't simply that these two films had been cut, but it was that many films had been cut in recent times that weren't being really covered Mm. by the media, and that there was, in fact, this 100-year history of censorship that was very unique to Australia. And I I worked on the book for four years, and the thing that that was ultimately the hook for me, because there was a time where it was just going to be like an encyclopedia of cut cut moments. Um, The hook was... Well, the history of film is basically the same length in the same timeline as the history of Federated Australia. Mm. And uh, you kind of had 1896, the, the advent of cinema in Australia, and then Federation in 1901. And there were all these sort of uh, these easy comparisons between what we were cutting, the films that were getting banned in Australia, and our perception of our national identity. And that kind of became the ultimate angle for Book of the Band. Look, it's fantastic because, as you say, they're inextricably linked. And that's one of the great things about the book. It's, it's quite expansive, even though it's got a very specific focus. You really are talking about Australian culture, you know, for the last hundred years or so. Um, you also talk to a lot of uh, pundits and experts, such as David Stratton, who <laughs> comes to mind, and some fascinating case studies. Indeed, I think each chapter is basically a, a particular case study um, by and large. Um, but I'm just wondering... You know, you mentioned films like that you wouldn't even think of having been censored like Star Wars. You know, you talk about the little snippet where um, Luke Skywalker's parents are, you know, the the charred corpses. That that had had to go. That wasn't. But a lot of it is because they actually just want to bring down the rating. So it's it's a financial impetus. It's not necessarily someone's imposing this ban from the outside saying, well, we want to get this rating. I guess indirectly it is, isn't it? Well, it's two two Mm. sides of it, right? So so you've got... Censorship by the censorship board, yes. which is the the body. It's now called the classification board mm. because they they don't cut films, right? So that's we'll get to that in a moment. So they were the censorship board, and they used to just strip films to ribbons. Mm. Okay, so if mm. it was too violent, you'd strip it down. Had too much coarse language, mm. sexuality, and this is by the by the standards of nineteen thirties, nineteen forties, up till the nineteen seventies. Ultimately, so that's the the sort of. It's independent, but let's say government-mandated censorship by the board. And then you've got self-censorship. So the Star Wars example there, um, 1977, we now have an R rating in Australia. We didn't have an R rating until 1971. Mm. And that's part of the issue. The censorship board, we're always sort of thinking, well... There, you know, films should be for everyone. So if if it's too much for a kid, we'll cut it out, even if it's a Michelangelo Antonioni film, <laughs> right? <laughs> so so the R rating comes around, and suddenly we can have quote unquote films for adults, but Fox, because Fox owned Star Wars mm-hmm. at the time, not mm-hmm. Disney, they have this this blockbuster in the making. They don't want to 
accidentally get an R rating because they know that Australia, deep down, is a very conservative mm, nation mm, as far as classification mm. goes. So, yes, you're exactly right. It's a financial imperative. Hey, we want this to go to as many people as possible. We're going to cut it and get a PG rating or an M rating. Uh, that's why they did it, but you can't extract that from the fact that the reason they did it was because they felt we were a conservative nation mm. and that this wouldn't have passed muster in a quote-unquote family film. Yeah, no, absolutely. And look, that's interesting what you were saying about Antonioni and so forth, that things that are deemed adult films, it's, it's not necessarily about, you know, smart or violence. It, there are when you say adult themes, you're talking about themes that are quite complex and that, mm. you know, a 12-year-old probably wouldn't get their heads around. And yet they're saying we want this, these films to be for everybody. Well, they're actually not for everybody. Exactly right. And one of the great examples is Breathless. Jean-Luc Godard's yes. Breathless, 1960. It's a rolled gold classic. You know, we, we all learn it in film school. I fell asleep watching it as a, <laughs> as a 19-year-old and then have come to, to appreciate it. But that was banned in Australia for the reason of immorality. So you've got this 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 central character who's uh you know he's a gangster he's a wannabe gangster he commits crimes he kills a cop um that was immoral so it was banned and mm. I think that's an interesting uh judgment call made by totally. the censors of the time yeah. but then Antonioni he made Blow Up I think 1966 or 67 mm. now this is a movie that is a countercultural classic so appreciated would have rankled people at the time but some of the things that were being cut from the film you know. A shot of uh, you know a shot of nudity here, uh, a, a swear word uh, there. But the kind of key thing that I return to, the censors watched blow up, and there's a moment where David Hemmings is on the phone and he says, "Tell him to get stuffed," <laughs> and they cut it. <laughs> and, and that is such a that's such a uh, a crystallizing moment for me. Where even when I discovered that was among the cut items, because get stuffed feels like such an Australian uh, colloquialism almost. It's a British film um, and Antonioni is an Italian director. Mm. But the fact that get, get stuffed <laughs> was considered too much for the sensitive ears of 1966, <laughs> um, that to me is is such an interesting idea of what what they what the censors felt were appropriate not just for children yeah. or inappropriate for children, but what was inappropriate for adults. So how did, um, and you do touch on this in the book, but maybe not to this extent, but how did those classics that one might encounter in film school now, such as, I don't know, Battleship Potemkin or The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, all those classic silent films, which have got a quite a large degree of, of, of violence hmm. and quite explicit at times. I mean, and yet they can have a, um, a high claim of being high art. Mm. And therefore, does that exempt them? Do they get past that or, or no? No, I mean... Um the the trouble is in that let's let's look at that first 50 60 years of of censorship mm. in Australia mm. right up until we got that R rating and and we got a classification board and the board itself then didn't cut films but they would ban it mm. so a whole different issue mm. Mm. Um, but in that first 60 years battleship Potemkin, cabinet of dr caligari you know th these examples you're mentioning yeah we look at them now it's high art the people on the censorship board these weren't art-minded folk, and I'm being very generous <laughs> in my description of them, but they're long dead now, so I hope they don't mind. Um, th it was there was very much a, a focus that the people on the censorship board should represent the community. Mm. And often, because there were so many conservative pressure groups, wowser groups, like the Good Film League, um, which was a, a sort of a women's interest group, um, but at that time, that was a very conservative motion. There was always this push that for the board to be community representative, they had to have a bunch of different people not from the world of film. So you would have an Olympian, you would have a television presenter, you would have a teacher. And I'm not saying they are, uh, ex they're exempt from having uh, good takes on films. No, no, of course. But they weren't film thinkers. No. And the chief censors of the time, um, John Alexander is, is a key one who said that horror films are for the moronic type. Mm. So it didn't matter if it was high art or if The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari was a, a breakthrough in cinema. Mm. It was a horror film, so it was for idiots. And or thus, it wasn't important enough to be saved. The Night of the Hunter, the classic, classic film, um, Robert Mitchum posing as a preacher. He's got hate and love tattooed on his two hands. Um, that was banned. It's, it's a horror film, but it's a, it's a drama. It was banned for blasphemy. Mm. because he was depicting a preacher. He wasn't actually a preacher. But it didn't matter the film's quality. It didn't matter if it was artful. If it was offensive, 
whether it's because of horror or because of its themes, um, they didn't they didn't consider the art until much later on. Um, but that kind of stirred up its own uh, <laughs> No, of course. Yeah. Look, I'm interested in what you said earlier too about the fact that a certain kind of censorship is still going on today. Mm. And in the, I think at the last chapter, um, before the, uh, the epilogue, you talk about Netflix and the whole way that streaming services have approached, I guess, in a way, self-censorship and how that's managed. Um, to what extent a lot of those attitudes you're talking about still floating around just below the surface? Have we really become much more enlightened or, or is it still the same old? I think Australia is a very conservative nation. I think yes. that's, you know, the the sort of preamble to the book talks about, you know, the story of the Kelly gang, the first motion picture ever made. It was mm, made in Australia. Mm. Uh, Bush ranging films, they were our first genre. And we've sort of, this is pre-Anzac. And I think so much of our national identity is tied into the Bush ranger Um and and you know larrikinism and not taking offence and and being a freewheeling nation of rule breakers, right? But the evidence is very contrary to that, um, largely because we also banned bush ranging films. So I think we are and have always been a very conservative nation. Now it's great that in 1971, Don Chip, actually mm. the, the um, founder of the Australian Democrats, he was the customs minister at the time, and he was so annoyed that there was all this complaining going on about censorship, primarily mm. from David Stratton, yeah, 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 <laughs> because he was the uh, head of the Sydney Film Fest at the Indeed. time. He introduces the R rating. He says we're not cutting films anymore, but we'll still ban films if they cross, you know, that very last line mm, of offence. Sure, okay. But what has happened ultimately is now you've got films that are being banned even if they are artful because they've crossed another moral line. Mm. And standards and mores may change, and they have changed over yes. 110, 130 years. But ultimately, we have a very conservative worldview of art. And this kind of goes back to, you know, what we were talking about is, okay, great. Now we've got people on the classification board who are um, have been filmmakers. They're, they're thinkers. They're people who are able to approach art and meet it, you know, uh, meet a filmmaker with what they're intending to do. But they still have to classify a film based on hard details. How much swearing is in it? How much mm. violence is in mm. it? There's a real, like a tangible matrix. There's a list of words. If you say the C word, it is guaranteed MA rating, right? So even though you're meeting it as art, there are still all these boundaries that you have to play within. And so if you're putting boundaries around art, I'm not saying there should be no boundaries, but if by doing that, you're ultimately embracing a conservative worldview mm. when it comes to art. That's so interesting. Rather than allowing a free-flowing discussion. That discussion's happening, but it's mm. happening at the classification board. Yes. And we're not finding out what they're saying. Sure, okay. <laughs> and so when it comes to now Netflix and streaming services, where the volume of content is so massive that the Australian government actually said, okay, Netflix doesn't want to submit films to the classification board anymore. They don't want to pay for it, and they just don't think you'll be able to keep up with the content. We're going to let them classify their own films. And so suddenly, that discussion that was happening at the classification board, compromised as it is as, as an Australian conversation, it's no longer even Australian conversation. Mm. Because what's happening is there's some guy or girl or, or a few people, random people in America, who are watching a Netflix movie, putting meta tags on it saying, it's got, net, it's got nudity, it's got violence, it's got this, it's got that, and then pumping out a rating that is based on American social mores and based on zero discussion, just based on technological tagging. And as I write in the book, they accidentally did it for a bunch of films that were already classified. Yes. And as a case study, all these films were getting classified more harshly than even in Australia. <laughs> so I think that is so interesting and scary. But the big thing for me, as I, as I hopefully allude to in the book, is we should be dis like it's art. Yes. We should be having the conversation. We should be allowed and trusted to have the conversation mm. with safe parameters. Mm. But those conversations have always existed in the shadows, and and now they're not even happening in Australia. Yeah, sure. Look, it's in, I just want to quickly go back to the c word because you you have an amusing example of um you know the, the how, how the frequency of the word and nil <laughs> by mouth wins. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Long shot. Very very hard. And I, I'd be lying if I said I watched uh, all the movies to count all the c oh, words. No, no, but of course. but nil by mouth apparently has the most. It was a great film. Great film. Yes. And and again, you know. Uh, 
the, the funny thing is, I mean, if you're going to have one, why not have 200? Because as soon as you have one in your film in Australia, you're slapped with an MA rating. Mm. So the difference between one and 200 is actually <laughs> negligible. <laughs> yeah, look, that, that's another thing I was going to ask you, because often you'll see films that, um, while not uh, showing full frontal nudity, might you know there might be a, a very discreet show of a nipple, for example, or, or a brief flash of someone, you know, full frontal. But uh, what is what you're saying too, in as much that that that's it's all it takes. It doesn't matter. Well, that nudity is is actually slightly different. So sure. coarse language is hard and fast. Yes, because it's a word. It's right. syllables. It's yes. it's so like you can't negotiate that. Um, nudity based on the angles, based on what this we see. This is what I was thinking. This exactly. is where it gets yes, very complicated. Yes. I mean, there's a great example where David Lynch um, in Mulholland Drive, mm. it, it didn't actually affect the, the Australian censorship, but it's just an example that I, I, I remember. He tried to limit the, um, the, the rating in America. by There was full frontal female nudity, but he blurred the pubic region. Mm. So what that actually created was a very sexless moment of nudity, which was kind of intriguing. And, and you go, well, was that a directorial choice? But then I was speaking to Margaret Anderson, who was a former director of the um, a classification board, and they did. They had the conversation mm. of a flash of nipple. Oh, it was side It was side boob. Oh, it was front on. It was for one second. It was for 10 seconds. It was someone getting out of the shower versus someone engaged in foreplay. Those were all factors that they would consider. Um, the most significant factor when it comes to nudity is an erection. Mm. And and uh, you do quite a <laughs> <laughs> We talk about erections quite a bit in the book. Um, but but that's because there is this perception that uh, a flaccid and I apologize to the listeners and yourself well but <laughs> there's this perception that well a man full frontal nudity but he's flaccid it's non-sexual. Mm. But if he's in uh, in a state of arousal, and that's actually words in the in the yes, legislation uh, in the guidelines, if he's in a state of arousal, then it ratchets up the rate. It's almost like they're saying he's effectively holding a loaded gun, <laughs> as, as opposed is. to one that's not loaded. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but it, it's so interesting because um, you know the state of arousal between a man and a woman mm. and the visibility of that mm. and again these judgment calls that mm. are being made and you know this idea that you've got a man standing he's completely flaccid there's another guy next to him or you know on a, on a separate screen mm. he's standing still but he's got an erection mm. one of those is MA and one of those is R mm. is, is kind of an intriguing to and fro now I'm not even saying that's wrong because mm. ultimately an MA rating means look if you're under the age of 18, you can go, but if you're under the age of 15, you have to go with a parent. R means, sorry, folks, you have to be 18 to see this one. Mm. But they're not censored. They're mm. not banned. They're, mm. just, they're just providing parameters and guidelines. What I found very interesting was that there was this history of um, sex on film and heterosexual sex on film that was passing by with an R rating. Mm. And whether it was simulated or not, it was okay to get an R rating and that's a, a good thing if, if, the, if it you know hits the right metrics or whatever you want to call it but there was this history of queer film and queer you know scenes of a queer couple that are mm. naked or engaged mm. in mm. sex simulated or unsimulated and those were just more frequently being banned and then you've got to go back to what we're talking about which is the judgment calls the morality the kind of questions that are going on behind closed doors about what should be seen and what should be unseen and i think that speaks to a kind of a comments on what we allow as australians absolutely and um just thinking about uh that kind of cinema, which is, I guess, um, not necessarily just queer cinema, but the kind of cinema that is probably, it's a fair bet it's going to be unpalatable to a large um, percentage sure. of the, uh, and thinking about guys like John Waters or Ken Russell or all yes. those wacky guys that are doing some really weird stuff. They're you know, making offensive, fi- John Waters makes offensive films. Yes. And other films, especially queer filmmakers who, you know, and we talk about this in the book, homosexuality was illegal up Indeed. until, you know, our lifetimes mm. in, in some nations, obviously. And, and, uh, and like these are acts of transgression. Yes. Their art should they be banned because they're being transgressive? Mm. Literally excluded from us being able to have the conversation about them. Well, you've, all, you've almost said that basically um, whether they're art or not is actually immaterial. The criteria is completely different. Totally. 
Yeah. So it's the, irrelevant. The conversation, and there was, um, oh gosh, I forget her name, but one of the uh, chief censors in the 1980s, there, she, in the annual report saying, like, this is what we banned. And there was a film called um, Tras El Cristal, a queer, queer mm. film. It screened at Queer Fest around the world. It's a well regarded movie. And she was saying, this was actually the best film that we banned, <laughs> like the, the highest quality. It, had, it was actually a very artful film. We really liked it, but we had to ban it. And uh, you always say had to ban it, you know, trying to, to use her language. And that was so interesting to me where you're right, the art didn't factor into it at all. And I, again, I always have to add this, this qualifier, which is the big, the big red line should be films that endanger or, you know, um, uh, put at risk the people involved in production, especially if they're underage. Now, so many of those examples do not even touch that line yet they were still banned because of assumptions mm. made or beliefs about Indeed. the filmmakers. Indeed. Yeah, absolutely. Now, it's it's also fascinating to have read your book in the context of having watched that wonderful series, I think it was ABC, um, Real Britannia, you know, the history of British filmmaking, okay, yeah. and looking at the censorship in the UK across many decades and comparing it to what was going on in Australia. And obviously there was a lot of crossover because a lot of the same films were being submitted for classification or censorship in both countries at the same time. I mean, just imagine if you were a person living in a particular time, so let's say the 50s in Australia, and you're looking across the the ocean somewhere and you're seeing what's going on and what's permitted. It must have been quite frustrating. I know you talk about Australia mm. having been a very conservative uh, society um, at that time, and that's a that's a generalisation. No, and indeed. what's interesting is, you know, in the nineteen there was, in, there was a royal commission in nineteen twenty six in Australia, basically into the motion picture industry, and that was saying like, look, we're importing all this smut, you know, quote unquote <laughs> smut. Um, we need to put more rules in place, and the the royal commission basically was on the side of the wowsers and said, yes, you're absolutely right. We need to be doing more to cut films and to protect the children. And once that was done, it actually uh, emboldened a lot of uh, religious groups, a lot of schools, the um, Salvation Army, to teach young people about film mm. because they thought it could be a, a mass conversion tool. You know, they could proselytize through film. But what they did over that 30, 40 year period was they developed a bunch of film critics, people who appreciated film. And so by the time they come of age in the late 50s and the 60s, suddenly they're realizing that there's all this countercultural product in the UK, sure. in the US, yes. but we're not getting it. We're not getting or it. Or we're getting it in cut form. And David Indeed. Stratton is the perfect example where he was actually, you know, he grew up in England, he comes to Australia in the early 60s, mm. and he's like, what the hell? Where, <laughs> where are all the good films? I know they exist. I just saw them. Um, and then goes to lead this, this um, battalion of, of film critics and appreciators. Yeah. But it was very frustrating for people at that time. But as you say, there was, you know, the video nasty era in, in <laughs> In, in Thatcherite England where films were being censored. And one of the questions I often get is, you know, oh, did you write this book because actually Australia had the worst censorship in the world mm. for film? And I said, no, that's not that's mm. not true. The mm. UK had the video nasties. The US, they had the Hayes Code Absolutely. early on. Great and, example. And they're still far more conservative as a society, I believe. Mm. And you can look to Malaysia and Singapore and Iran and all these nations. Like, film censorship exists everywhere. But the but balloon that I was trying to pierce was this idea that Australia was the she'll be right mate <laughs> freewheeling nation that let everything through its doors. We just we just haven't and mm. we still don't. Mm. And mm. even this year, three major releases have been self censored for a more lenient rating, including Martin Scorsese's says Killers of the Flowers mm, Moon, mm, <laughs> which mm. is baffling to me. Um, so it, it's just just to reiterate, like this perception we have of ourselves, you know, if you look only at the story of film censorship, it kind of uh, hopefully illuminates what we actually don't allow. Well, in well it, it paints a different picture. Yes, exactly. It? Yeah, which, which is fantastic. I mean, it's interesting just on um, from personal experience too. Depending on which school you went to. I was at um, a certain school in the early 80s where as part of our f- um, English or English literature mm. curriculum, they would watch the film adaptations. So they this was a Catholic school, mind yeah. you, and they would still show us Apocalypse Now, The Deer Hunter. Oh, wow. Okay. No problem with that because <laughs> we were studying Joseph Conrad or whatever, yes. you know. 
That is so weird to me now to think about, well, hang on a second. You've got these ostensibly at that time, it looks like they were quite enlightened. Yeah, I think yeah, I remember um, to that to that exact point, I remember watching Polanski's Macbeth mm, <laughs> in sure. like year nine or whatever it's it was. Just like, what? <laughs> what is going on? And, um, you know, one of the, the case studies in the book yes. is referring to the Australian dream. Mm. which is a documentary about Adam Goods and the racism he mm, faced as an Aboriginal Australian uh, and as an Aboriginal man. And um, it has a C word in it. So it's slapped with an MA. Now, that can still be shown in schools. And that was kind of the angle I was trying, or you know, the, the frustration I had was, you put an MA rating on it, this is a case where actually that's going to dissuade some parents. There will be some parents who sit with their kids and watch it. Mm. There will be some parents who sign the waiver to allow the teachers to show their kids mm. in school. Mm. But maybe they won't. And maybe they'll limit the amount of people who or young people who can watch a film like that purely because it has a C word in it. But again, in this context, we're talking about the racist abuse that Adam Good was talking about. So what are we really what in that case, what are we classifying here? What are we not censoring, but what are we putting up the barricades it's around? Like you're saying this this one single couple of syllables or one syllable in that yes. case um, <laughs> is is outweighing all that other stuff, which is so important. Yes, and needs to be seen by everybody. Or rather, or in addition to that, I should say, um, maybe this is how a 14 year old should learn about. And I'm being facetious saying they're learning about the word at 14. They've known it for five years yeah, already but, now. But the way it's used. Exactly. In, as no, a weapon and the weaponization correct. of it and mm, say, mm. look, you know, this is what I like that word. Words have have meaning and they carry weight. And that's the argument that the classification boards say. But this is an example where I think, you know, gosh, wouldn't it be great to show that in schools? I doubt very highly that Apocalypse Now and Polanski's Macbeth are still being shown yeah, exactly. in schools. It's yeah. extraordinary, yeah. Um, look, so maybe as, as a last question, if I may, uh, sure. this is um, Writing WA's Pod Street, so we'd like to talk a little bit about the writing process. You <laughs> mentioned that this could easily have been an, an encyclopedia with different entries, but you've chosen to have a, a, like a more sort of narrative approach, and it is very engaging to read, Thank you. I have to say, so congratulations. What was it like for you, the whole the process of, of, of writing this book? It was um, it was fun. Mm. <laughs> it was everyone says like, was it hard? The hard part was I've self published the book. Yes, that the literally the administrative side of that mm. and wanting it to be mm. robust. So yes. engaging an editor, engaging a lawyer, um, you know, working through the proofs and, and all that kind of stuff, and then putting it out there and selling it and 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 getting it to shops. That's the hard part. Writing it was really fun, um, but. It was a process. It took me four years, but it probably didn't sh take shape until that final 18 months. Um, you know, I started in 2019 when my wife got pregnant and I thought, oh, I've wanted, always wanted to write the book. I'll see if I can knock one out before the baby comes, which was of now in retrospect, very optimistic. <laughs> a very optimistic approach. But I was doing it piecemeal and then COVID happened. That gave me a bit more time. I've changed jobs in the interim and I stopped writing professionally, mm. uh, writing reviews. So that actually helped quite a lot. But yeah, that first idea was, all right, I'm just going to do deep research, find the movies and describe the scenes. And um, that was risky to a degree because I found that's actually illegal in WA, right. okay. <laughs> um, unless it's an educational book. So I kind of diverted a little bit. Um, but then when I realized we're talking, we're not talking dozens of films, we're talking thousands of films mm. and sliced moments. Mm. And so then I started going, well, I need to talk to the experts, Margaret Pomeranz, David Stratton, mm -hmm. and they all had these incredible stories, Philip Adams as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. And and then it became that kind of case study approach. And that was a way for me to break it down mm. bit by bit as well mm. over that period mm. of time. And then it really was in that final 18 months that I say, like the the switch kind of flicked and I said, I can't believe I haven't even realized the history of film can be lined up against the history of of colonial or you know federated Australia, yes, not yes. not the entirety of Australia. And the national identity question kind of emerged. And and that's when I finally I, from that point on I was flying. And then that's ultimately why I decided to self publish because over the years I would write a little bit and submit to see if there was interest mm. with a publisher. Mm. And I got turned down a few times. And I ultimately, I was turned down 10 times by, by different publishers. And I that's that's not a lot, I would say. You know, I think there are probably authors uh, out there. I was going to say, yeah. yeah, that's, that, yeah. Um, I didn't exhaust my no. avenues. But I also knew this was such a niche topic. There was only going to be a, a, a handful of, of viable 
publishers in in Australia for this kind of Indeed. thing. And then, honestly, I finished the book, and there was an urgency I felt about it, and there was a timeliness to it, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to have a crack on my own. Talk to the wife about it, uh, or my wife. I should say the wife. <laughs> Talk to my wife Jenny about it, and and put together a bit of a Kickstarter strategy, a funding strategy, and and wanting it to be robust. But that's ultimately why I went down the self publishing route. I was turned down a bunch. Don't get me wrong, and I would have loved to have been published. Mm, no, no, sure. Um, but I didn't want to sit on this. It did. It didn't. I didn't want this to be a calling card manuscript. This was a story I wanted to tell, and I felt there was kind of modern day relevance. Yeah, and you wanted it out there. Yeah, I wanted it yeah, out there. It needs to be timely, as you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. So I enjoyed Fantastic. the whole process, and you know, if if it had been a different subject matter or a fiction book, and it never got published, I would have had you know gotten some value out sure. of it. But the confluence, like I felt like this was the story that I wanted to tell. Yeah. Yeah, no, fantastic. Well, we're very grateful that you persisted and, you, and you've done that. Now, you mentioned in the shop, so let, let's be very clear. Where can people buy Book of the Band? Yeah, so you can get it directly from me at bookoftheband.com, um, but it is in uh, about 40 shops across yeah, the country. Fantastic. So if you go to bookoftheband.com, I've actually got a list of retailers there. So always great to support them, and I've, I've been so grateful to those retailers who, mm. have, who have supported a self-published author on a with a very disgusting book. <laughs> <laughs> and thank goodness it's the Book, book of the Band, but it's not band itself. It's uh, for now, yes. <laughs> it's very much available. Look, Simon Morado, thank you for joining us on Pod Street. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank and you, Will. Pod Street on Beaufort Street this time. Love it. <laughs> thank you, mate.